Good evening, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. My name is Grace Choi, and I'm a public diplomacy officer at the US Embassy in Tokyo. Thank you all for joining us today for our conversation with a Fulbright alum, Glenn S. Fukushima. We're really happy to have you here today. Just a couple of things ahead of our session today. Uh, recording and photography, uh, we ask you not to do so. Uh, we, will be record, uh, we will be recording and we will be taking some photos on your behalf. At the bottom of your screen, if you are on a laptop or a, a computer, you should see a box um, for Q&A. If you do have any questions during this session, please do submit your questions there. For those of you who are interested in listening to this webinar in Japanese, uh, we are providing simultaneous interpretation. Also at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little globe. And if you click on the globe, it will give you an option to listen either in Japanese or in English. Um, and of course, depending on what device you're using, the display me method may be a little bit different and all the functions may not be available, um, but these are some of the features that we did want to highlight for you. All right. Um, and now I'd like to uh, turn it over to, um, to the U.S. Ambassador to Japan, Rahm Emanuel, for some opening remarks. The United States and Japan went from bitter foes to the best of friends, from enemies to unrivaled allies. After the end of World War II, Senator William Fulbright sought to promote international cooperation, collaboration, and connection through education. To do so, he developed the Fulbright Scholarship Program. And let's just quote his words. To bring a little more knowledge, a little more reason, and a little more compassion into world affairs, and thereby increase chances that nations will learn at last to live in peace and friendship. For more than 70 years, the Fulbright program has brought together the best and the brightest students and scholars from Japan and America. To date, 10,000 Japanese Fulbright alumni have made countless contributions in economics and education, culture and commerce, medicine and manufacturing. Each has helped advance our alliances, shared values, shared interests, and shared goals. Fulbright Japan has possibly the most powerful and prestigious Fulbright participants. It's easy to see why six Japanese Fulbright alumni have gone on to become Nobel Prize winners. One is a Fields Medal, medal winner, and several have become government ministers and university presidents. The Fulbright Scholarship has transformed the trajectory of Japanese program participants, and each program participant has strengthened and solidified the U.S.-Japan alliance and friendship. While we are proud of the Fulbright's past, we're most excited to continue to promote and protect the Fulbright's future by attracting applicants with diverse voices, with diverse backgrounds. To participate in the program, we will ensure Fulbright is a flagship for our nation's collective work and common future. Whatever the circumstances or challenges our countries have confronted, Year after year, Fulbrighters from America and Japan have studied together, served together, and solved problems in partnership together. Shared security, shared economic possibility, and even a shared love of baseball link our peoples. At its core, the common connections between our nations are based on shared values and a shared vision. Both have roots in the Fulbright program. Senator Fulbright was right. Knowledge, reason, and compassion have brought the United States and Japan peace and prosperity. Yesterday, today, and well into the future. Thank you.
Thank you to Ambassador Emmanuel. Now I'd like to turn it over to our Minister Counselor for Public Affairs, Philip Roskamp, who is also serving as the chairperson for the Fulbright Commission here in Japan. Philip? Thank you, Grace. Good evening here in Tokyo. It's a pleasure to join you for a conversation with Fulbright alum, Glenn S. Fukushima. Hey, Glenn. So my name is Philip Roskamp and I'm from San Antonio, Texas. So I'm the head of public affairs here at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. And one of the most important things that my team and I do is promote higher education and education exchange. You know, as part of our education work, I also serve as chair of the Japan-U.S. Education Commission, or Fulbright Japan. For more than 80 years, the Fulbright program has given ed education opportunities to students and, school, uh, and scholars, artists and teachers, and professionals of all backgrounds around the world. Fulbright Japan, as the ambassador mentioned, was founded 70 years ago, and thousands have participated in the program. Among the many accomplished Japanese alumni are Nobel Prize winners, Fields Medal winners, government ministers, university presidents. You know, study abroad at its core is a life-changing experience. It changed me. I think it changed Glenn Fukushima. I assume the same is true for our moderator, Nancy Snow, but most importantly, it can change you. So as we try to improve lives and livelihoods through exchanges, last year we had an exceptional moment when a Fulbright alum, Glenn S. Fukushima, announced a $1 million donation to support Fulbright Japan. We made that announcement during President Biden's May 2022 trip to Tokyo, and I was there with Glenn at the ambassador's residence when he met the president and explained the gracious donation as they shook hands. You know, Glenn's donation is the single largest donation ever made to Fulbright Japan and one of the largest ever made to the Fulbright program anywhere. The donation also coincided with the 70th anniversary of Fulbright Japan last year, which we celebrated with both the emperor and the empress. So tonight, Glenn's gonna share a little bit about his experience as a Fulbrighter and what motivated him to give back to Fulbright. To our alumni who are uh, joining us this evening, thank you for all of your contributions to building stronger ties between the US and Japan through education exchange. If you're not an alum, but you're considering studying abroad, I encourage you to consider studying in the United States and even applying for the Fulbright program. You know, there are more than 4,000 higher education institutions in the United States with the top faculty, the top facilities, and the top student talent in the world. So thanks so much. Back over to you, Lewis. Thanks, Philip. And now I'd like to turn it over to our moderator, Dr. Nancy Snow. Of her many, many accomplishments and achievements, I'd say one of her, one of her biggest is being not a one-time, not a two-time, but a three-time recipient of the Fulbright Scholarship. She's been a Fulbright grantee to Greece, oh, excuse me, to Germany, to Japan, and will soon be headed off to Greece for her third, third round with the Fulbright program. Dr. Snow. Thank you very much, Grace. And really, we're here to celebrate my longtime friend, Glenn Fukushima, um, and your generosity. I think that everybody in this webinar knows of all of the accomplishments of uh, this very, very honored alumni of the program. And I really wanna give the floor now to Glenn to talk about your motivation for this gift and to outline your background and how Fulbright really changed you. So I'm going to hand it over to you, my friend. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nancy. And uh, let me begin by thanking the uh, U.S. Embassy in Tokyo and also the Japan-United States uh, Educational Commission or the Fulbright Japan Program uh, for uh, hosting today's webinar. Um, I also want to uh, thank the uh, Japan-U.S. Educational Commission, USEC, for supporting Japanese studies, uh, for Japanese to study in the United States and also uh, supporting Americans to study in Japan. Um, 
finally, in addition to the, the embassy and to uh, Jusek and, and Nancy, I want to thank uh, the uh, audience today uh, for joining uh, on this prime time evening on a Tuesday evening to uh, share thoughts about the Fulbright program and about uh, study abroad. So as was mentioned, um, I am a Fulbrighter, 1982-83 at the University of Tokyo. And in the 20 minutes I've been allotted today, I'd like to answer the five questions I posed in my outline here. Uh, and uh, because of the limited time, let me go right into uh, the first question, which is why I applied to Fulbright. So I was a PhD student in the uh, sociology program at Harvard. Uh, and in 1981, I applied. But I was in a somewhat unusual situation because I had gone to Harvard and first got a master's in regional studies East Asia, uh, which is area studies, and then did everything except the dissertation. So all but dissertation in sociology, uh, where I was a teaching fellow for uh, Ezra Vogel, Edwin Reischauer, and David Riesman. Uh, but then I thought perhaps I uh, was not exactly fitted to be a, a scholar. So I decided to uh, go to a professional school and I couldn't decide between business school and law school. So uh, being somewhat greedy, I uh, chose a joint program in law and business and uh, spent time in the uh, law school and the MBA program or the business uh, MBA program at business school and the JD program at the law school. So after having spent uh, eight years, in graduate school, uh, I uh, was ready to work on my dissertation. And my dissertation uh, was a way to combine my interest in these four areas, area studies, sociology, uh, business, and law. And that topic was antitrust law and policy in Japan and focused organizationally on uh, the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, as it was called then, uh, the Japan Fair Trade Commission and the Japanese business community. And secondly, why I selected Fulbright over the other uh, full, uh, full, uh, scholarship opportunities that I was presented. Um, first, uh, I knew that history had such a distinguished history and tradition and prestige, a high reputation for its excellence, and uh, a stellar alumni community. Uh, secondly, I knew that Fulbright offered uh, in Japan, but also elsewhere, a strong support infrastructure for grantees. Uh, at the time when I arrived in Japan in the fall of 1982, the JUSEC office, the uh, Fulbright office in Tokyo, was headed by Caroline Matano Yang, who was a uh, has become, was a legendary figure uh, among the Fulbright uh, heads of the Fulbright office here. I think she worked on that position for almost 20 years, and uh, Ms. Kamimura and uh, Ms. Iwata were among the others who really took good care of the uh, Fulbrighters who came from the United States. Uh, the other aspect of Fulbright that I think is so important uh, is that the fellow Fulbrighters are among the best and the brightest. And uh, it was possible to learn a lot from my fellow Fulbrighters um, that year, uh, some of whom I still keep in touch with. The third question about what I gained from my Fulbright experience, um, it's obvious that I spent that time doing dissertation research on the subject of antitrust law and policy. So I spent time at not only the University of Tokyo, where Professor Takeuchi was my advisor, but also uh, at Sofia University, where Professor Matsushita, Nikkyo University, Professor Funada, and Keio University, Professor Shoda, were all focused on um, antitrust law and policy. Uh, I also learned a lot from the government agencies that I uh, spent a lot of time interviewing, the prime minister's office, uh, well, I wrote METI here, but it was actually METI at the time, uh, Japan Fair Trade Commission, Ministry of Justice, Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Construction, Ministry of Post and Telecommunications, the Economic Planning Agency, et cetera. And then uh, thirdly, uh, I uh, spent some time at the Diet and with the politicians, especially in the Liberal Democratic Party, uh, Japan Socialist Party, uh, Japan Communist Party, and Komeito, uh, to get a, uh, a political perspective on the subject. I also spent a lot of time with the business community, the Keidanden, Japan Business Federation, uh, the Keizai Doyukai, the Japan Association of Corporate Executives, uh, Japan uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry, um, uh, et cetera. Um, 
the legal community, uh, the lawyers, the judges, the prosecutors, who are also playing an important role in this, the journalists and mass media, who are also quite involved in this issue of antitrust law and policy. Um, and so during my time doing dissertation research, I obviously learned a lot for my dissertation, but also got to know the uh, Japanese economy and the model of capitalism that Japan offered, which was significantly different from the model of capitalism that one finds in the United States or in European countries. Also the nature of Japanese competition was I, something I learned a great deal about. And uh, there was a very famous uh, uh, Miti official named Mr. Amaya who wrote an article, uh, which it was translated uh, as the, uh, uh, the ethic of harmony and the logic of the anti-monopoly law, which really kind of, uh, symbolized the differences between uh, the Japanese view of antitrust and the American view of antitrust. So in my pro subsequent professional career, um, and I've done a number of different things uh, as a lawyer, also as a government official at USTR, Office of the US Trade Representative for five years, also in uh, companies. I worked for four American companies, one European company over a 22 year period. period. Uh, also working on the board of directors of corporations in the United States and Japan and Europe. Also as president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Japan. Uh, also I've done some teaching at a number of universities. And finally, in working with NGOs and MPOs in all of these professions and, and uh, professional work that I've done, uh, I feel that my Fulbright experience was quite instrumental in uh, giving me a better understanding of um, not only the subject of antitrust, but about how Japanese society and economy operates. And as I'll mention later, uh, it also, the Fulbright experience and studying abroad, I think helped me to understand other countries behind, beyond just the United States and, um, and Japan. So paint, turning to the second page of my outline, uh, the, uh, the fourth question as to why I contributed to Fulbright, um, as um, more time passes and I get older, I am uh, increasingly uh, convinced about the importance of education and education to develop individuals and empower individuals uh, to, to really realize their potential, uh, but also to promoting and ensuring democracy. And finally, there are so many problems around the world, whether it's climate change or poverty or uh, disease, pandemics, there's so many problems. and uh, we need a lot of good, bright people to uh, answer those problems and to try to solve the problems. And so for all those reasons, I feel that education is so important. And uh, in that context, I've been personally concerned over the last several years about the decline in the number of Japanese students who are studying abroad, but also especially in the United States. And there are data indicating that uh, in 1997, it was the peak of Japanese students studying in the United States for at least one year at the university level, uh, more than 47,000 study uh, from Japan were studying in the United States in that year. However, recently in 2020, Japan had dropped from number one to number 11 and from more than 47,000 students to uh, only a little more than 11,000 students. Uh, China by comparison has uh, anywhere between 350 to 390,000 students uh, every year in the United States. Uh, this is pre-pandemic, but still, I think the magnitude of the uh, decline uh, by Japanese students studying abroad is uh, some, something uh, which I've really been very concerned about. Uh, second, I've also been concerned about the decline of Japanese studies in the United States. Uh, there's a certain major American university, uh, the name will go uh, unstated, uh, but I learned from a professor teaching there that uh, there are eight professors at that university teaching about contemporary China, uh, six professors teaching about contemporary Korea, both North and South, and only two professors teaching about contemporary Japan. Also, I think it's uh, reasonably well known in the Japanese uh, studies community that in four American major universities, uh, Stanford, where I went to undergraduate, uh, Yale, Princeton, and Columbia, uh, these major universities do not have a tenured professor of Japanese politics. And this, despite the fact, as Ambassador Emanuel and uh, Phil Roskamp mentioned 
initially in their opening remarks, uh, despite the fact that the US-Japan relationship is so important and the need to understand each other and to work with each, each other is uh, more important now than ever before in the post-war period. Um, and so another reason for my contribution to Fulbright is because I felt that, that the response there is a responsibility for those of us who benefited from programs such as Fulbright uh, to give back to the program and to allow others to benefit as we did. Uh, and I also hope that I can help stimulate uh, fellow Fulbright alumni, both in Japan and the United States, to contribute to the program. Uh, and finally, as was mentioned by Philip, uh, this last year was the 70th anniversary of Fulbright in Japan. So I thought it was a very opportune timing to uh, make this uh, contribution. So number five, uh, the final question that I asked myself, uh, the benefits of studying abroad. I've given this considerable thought because uh, I have spent probably over the last um, maybe 50 years on at least five or six programs where I've studied abroad. And so I've really benefited from these programs. And obviously the opportunity to study abroad means that you get to understand another country, another culture, another language, which in and of itself is very valuable. But secondly, I have really found that my study of Japan has, has helped me to understand America much better. Uh, I think by comparing the United States and Japan, which are very different countries in many ways, despite the shared values, uh, one can really understand America much better. Um, I don't have enough time to get into this, but I could actually write a book about how uh, my study and uh, engagement with Japan has helped me to understand my own country, America, much better. And some of the aspects that I'd like to just mention uh, that studying abroad, I think, really uh, encourages uh, is, I think, a, 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 a tendency to compare. You know, if you spend a lot of time in another country, you can't help but compare that country to your own country and to evaluate. Uh, there are some aspects that may be more positive, maybe more negative, more efficient, less efficient. Uh, also to question, I think that uh, studying abroad really does stimulate when someone to, to be provoked into thinking that, you know, there's not only one way of doing things, there may be many different ways and strengths and weaknesses of each. Also, I think it, studying abroad really does force people to listen. Uh, you have to listen very carefully, uh, not only because it's another language, but the language itself, even if you understand the language, the meaning behind the language may be different from that in your own country. Uh, also, I think studying abroad will uh, usually um, encourage one to be flexible, adaptable, uh, agile, and often innovative because you're confronted with new um, environments. Uh, it's not the same thing every day. And so you, ha you have to be innovative to, to deal with these new, new things. I also think it, it often teaches um, humility uh, because you realize that there are a lot of differences in the world and your way of doing things or the way that your country or culture deals with things may not be the only way and probably is not the only way uh, to get things done. So I, did, I think it does teach a lot of uh, humility. A lot of, I, I find that many people who are um, not humble, uh, don't have humility, are often people who don't have exposure to other countries and cultures. I do think it does uh, study abroad, does um, uh, force people to respect differences, uh, to value diversity, and often to um, be able to manage diversity better. Um, also, crisis management is something that I certainly have been able to uh, uh, add to my uh, skill sets, in part because a new culture, a new language, a new uh, society different from your own uh, confronts you with um, uh, unique uh, challenges that you have to deal with. Um, and then finally, the global perspective that Ambassador Emanuel mentioned in his opening comments about uh, in a uh, world where we have a lot of conflict and uh, need to cooperate among countries, um, you know, we often talk about like-minded countries, but um, although countries may be like-minded, uh, they probably have different ways of doing things. And so to have a global perspective is, I think, very helpful in order to be able to cooperate and work collaboratively with other countries and cultures. And certainly that's the case between the United States and Japan. Um, and then the last thing I'd like to mention is that in my own experience, um, studying abroad and especially in the Fulbright program uh, helped me to understand other countries 
and cultures beyond the US and Japan. Now, what I mean by that is that um, I worked uh, for eight years for a European uh, country and had a lot of experience uh, during those eight years going to Europe, working with colleagues in uh, France, Germany, England, Spain, and other countries. And I came to the conclusion that among the G7 countries, at least, the United States and Japan are polar extremes in many respects. Um, some of the examples that come to mind are the way the two countries deal with healthcare uh, or immigration or gun control. I mean, gun control, I think probably everyone agreed that it would, would agree that among the um, G7 countries uh, that the US has the laxest gun control laws and Japan has the tightest gun control laws. Uh, if one looks at uh, shareholders versus stakeholders, the whole discussion about corporate governance, again, I think we find uh, in most studies about corporate governance that uh, the emphasis on shareholders versus stakeholders, which is obviously changing uh, both in the United States and Japan, still the US and Japan are the polar extremes among the G7 countries. Uh, also, the, the number and variety of outside directors on corporate boards. Uh, we could, one could probably talk about things like public transportation as well, where the US and Japan are so different. But what I found was that by getting to learn about Japan, understand Japan, and contrasting it with the United States, that many of the European countries, I found, uh, lie somewhere in between. Uh, so whether it's Britain or France or Germany or Italy or Canada or other, other G7 or even maybe some G20 or OECD countries, many of these countries fit somewhere between the US and Japan. And so I found it much easier to understand these other countries and cultures in part because I've seen the two extremes of the United States and Japan. And there've been you know, many books written about the exceptionalism of the United States, uh, as well as the uniqueness of Japan. But I think it's true that these two countries are quite different and uh, understanding these two countries can really uh, help put a frame or perspective in which to uh, see other countries and understand other countries. So let me turn to the conclusion uh, because I'm almost out of time. Uh, I hope that um, Japanese American students will apply to Fulbright and take advantage of the wonderful opportunities that it presents. Uh, the uh, uh, fund that uh, I've been able to uh, create with the help of the JUSEC, Japan US uh, Educational Commission, will provide some additional benefits to some of the existing uh, fellowship opportunities, which I hope that applicants will take advantage of. And I do hope that um, the uh, contribution I've made uh, will uh, encourage other Fulbright alumni uh, and to join me in supporting uh, JUSEC and promoting uh, study abroad. So thanks very much. I hope I've done that in 20 minutes and I'm open to questions and discussion. Well, Glenn, you mentioned that uh, you could write a book perhaps about this. And I think we've just seen the outline for that book. Uh, I wanted to mention at the top, um, there's a fellow I call a national treasure when it comes to international educational exchange, Dr. Alan Goodman, the president of the Institute of International Education. And when I got my Fulbright to Germany, I got my letter from IIE. And uh, Dr. Goodman recently gave a talk to uh, high school students. And he assumed that uh, most all of them had their driver's license. And probably 1% of them had a passport. But his point related to study abroad is that really, study abroad, the Fulbright in particular, is the driver's license of the 21st century. And that's the point that you've just made here tonight. And I know you and I spoke in the last week about some of the hindrances to participating in study abroad in general. We've seen the numbers drop. And when I talk to my students, it's often, I can't afford it, I can't go abroad. So I believe, Glenn, that you have addressed this somewhat with this fund, <laughs> I would say big time. <laughs> but I also just want to acknowledge too that, that I consider your remarks here 
you're really at this level of being an ambassador for international exchange. And all of us who are Fulbright alums should really consider ourselves as citizen ambassadors for exchange in general, but particularly for the Fulbright program. We always say it changed my life and it does, it changes your trajectory. So can you address some of those hindrances, those pauses about participating and going abroad, getting that passport and going abroad? Sure. Well, what I think, and I, I agree with uh, with all of what you said, and uh, uh, I uh, think that with regard to uh, hindrances or barriers for Japanese studying abroad, um, there are, there are probably at least you know twenty factors you can mention, uh, but one of them I think has to do with the fact that probably compared to Japan, um, many other countries uh, reward people who go abroad and uh, get degrees from say American universities, especially selective American universities, I think Japan until recently um, has been less inclined to do so. Um, so I think that's just the kind of the, um, the incentives to go abroad have been less in Japan than many other countries, especially in Asia. But the cost question that you mentioned is a, is a very important one because I was talking recently to a Japanese uh, friend, a journalist friend who said that his daughter had been admitted by Swarthmore College, a very, very um, high quality uh, liberal arts college in the United States. But because the tuition there apparently is more than $70,000, uh, he said that he would not be able to afford it. Um, now, fortunately, his daughter being a, being a brilliant student was able to get a full scholarship to go. But the um, tuition at American, uh, some of the American universities um, can be as high as like seven times the uh, uh, tuition of uh, uh, Japanese uh, major private universities. So the cost factor is is pretty significant. And that's really one of the reasons that I, I uh, was motivated to make this contribution because uh, among the many reasons uh, the Japanese don't apply to go abroad as much as they used to is the tuition increase in the United States universities has been so high. So the, we all know that uh, the Japanese passport is the most powerful, among the most powerful in the world with access to visa-free access to 190 countries. Um, but I think uh, maybe one out of four of the Japanese has a passport in the US. It's about one out of three. So there too, uh, there seems to be this need to have this exchange of persons, not only between the US and Japan, but as you said, developing that global perspective, participating in Fulbright so that you understand other countries. I thought that was such an excellent point. You don't really understand your own home country until you leave it. So what are your thoughts about that as well? I got a, a whole load of questions that were submitted beforehand by some of the participants. So maybe right. in the next 10 minutes, we can mm -hmm. do kind of a rapid round. <laughs> sure. Well, you know, you reminded me that one of the things I didn't, uh, that I neglected to mention is that uh, this issue that when, um, say Japanese uh, go to the United States to the United States on a Fulbright grant, uh, they not, not only get exposure to the United States, obviously, but to many other countries because Fulbright has so many students from other countries who are studying in the United States. And uh, there's a great learning opportunity about other countries because American universities tend, many of the, at least the, the, the best universities attract the best and the brightest from around the world. So it's an opportunity not only to learn from what's the American uh, higher education, what it offers, but also what's offered by uh, professors and students and the academic community from around the world who come to the United States because it does offer um, a, a very, I mean, it's a very uneven, obviously there are, in the United States there's great disparities, but the best American higher uh, institutes of higher education are among the very best in the world. So. It does attract people from around the world. And I've found myself that um, many Japanese as well as others studying in the United States on Fulbright and other, and other grants get to know people. In fact, in some cases end up marrying people from other countries who are there in the United States to study on Fulbrights and, and other grants. So it really is an opportunity for global 
education and connections. I think that's the other point too, connections and networks uh, increasingly because of globalization, increasing because of uh, IT and the ability through the internet to connect with people. I think compared to 30 or 40 years ago, the notion of belonging to a global community, especially whether it's you know global community on climate change or global community on pandemics or cybersecurity or whatever, it's so important to be able to connect and work with people from around the world. And uh, studying abroad will, I think, open the path for those opportunities. Well, and you know, living in Washington, I, I had an opportunity to know Fulbright um, and he was very dedicated to student exchanges. So would you say that you put the emphasis with this fund on students? Because of course there are Fulbright professorships too, but I know Fulbright really wanted most of the awards to go to young people. Well, you know, I think there are real pluses of uh, having younger people and professionals both. I mean, you know, at the high school level, you know, say AFS programs and others, very, very kind of impressionable age for uh, students uh, pre-college to study abroad and then post-college, during college, after college in, as professionals. So I think there are, are benefits to be gained from each of those levels. But um, my real interest, uh, based on my own experience, was to be able to help fund those students, Americans and Japanese, at the um, um, the uh, graduate school level, after getting their undergraduate degrees and before they become, um, you know, professionals uh, in their careers. So uh, the period, probably in their twenties, when they they will be probably young enough to to receive influence and to they're not kind of set in their ways and they're open to new challenges and, and learning, uh, but they also have probably focused on a path of uh, some area of specialization that they can really uh, develop and excel in uh, by uh, studying on Fulbrights and other graduate degree programs. Glenn, I have a great question from the audience now uh, who says, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. I am an alumna of Fulbright. Uh, which would be a female, right, alumna. I yep. came back from the United States last summer. I am wondering where you see your generosity coming from. You could have uh, kept this uh, <laughs> money for yourself and your family. Uh, what motivated you with this generous contribution? And also, if you could add any words for an alumna of Fulbright, she would really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Uh, that um, opens the way for a, lo a long answer, but I'll try to keep it short. Um, uh, I'm actually someone who did not uh, come from a, uh, a highly advantaged uh, family background. My parents didn't go to college, for instance. Uh, I really do feel that I benefited so tremendously from education. And uh, I think that uh, the schools that I went to, Peace Springs College, Stanford University, Harvard, uh, University of Tokyo, Keio University, these were all really excellent places where I learned substantively, but I learned, uh, I, I got to know professors and students who later went on to do wonderful things. So education to me is one of the most important assets that an individual can have. And therefore um, I felt that um, because I've been fortunate enough to, um, have a certain amount of financial security. Uh, I have, you know, invested in certain things like art and music and politics. But, but I think education is so important, and uh, giving others the opportunity to uh, realize their potential is so important that that's uh, basically why I decided to make the contribution. And I should say that this is one, but I'm actually thinking about two or three other contributions <laughs> that I will be announcing in the next uh, uh, year to two years. Um, they're all education related. Um, the other aspect about your question that I want to address is um, uh, women. And because I do think that uh, Japan is a society where there is so much potential uh, that women have that are not being fully realized. And I, many of the successful women I've met in Japan, not all obviously, but many of them have had overseas experience. They went abroad and got an MBA or you know worked uh, in, in uh, or maybe they were an AFS student. They and, you know, and in fact, there was a, a Fulbright alumna who said that uh, as a result of going abroad and uh, studying, she 
really op it really opened her eyes and uh, she said it really uh, she felt it was so important to get out of your comfort zone and being in Japan in many ways it's a comfortable society and so it's clean it's orderly you know trains run on time great restaurants very clean comfortable safe you know so so getting out of that comfort zone and being challenged with new opportunities new ways of thinking um, new people um, I think it can be very stimulating and very um, exciting and I think I know many women from Japan who have been uh, really stimulated to do new things as a result of studying abroad so I'm especially uh, hopeful to encourage uh, women from Japan to study abroad. Well, that's wonderful to hear. And, you know, I wanted to mention when I came back to Japan in 2010, I was sent to all the American cultural centers to talk about Obama's Asia pivot and his new public diplomacy. And in every uh, meeting we had, there were Fulbrighters. But many of these were men who had gone on Fulbrights in the 50s and perhaps even into the early 60s. So what you're talking about here is really looking at the future. And we've just got a few more minutes before we wrap up the formal part of the program. But where, where do you see Fulbright going in the future? What would you like to see? What would be the ideal that would come out of this uh, very generous fund? Well, I would like to obviously see more people, uh, numbers of people from Japan studying in the United States, from um, uh, the United States studying in Japan. Also, um, it's my understanding that uh, Fulbright in recent years has not put as much emphasis as in the past in the STEM fields, uh, science, technology, engineering, uh, mathematics. And uh, that's something that uh, I understand is undergoing some modification. So I, I hope, especially there, you know, so the six Nobel uh, Prize winners who are Fulbrighters is really a, a, a just a, a, a indication of just how um, important Fulbright is. And uh, so I, I hope that the STEM fields can be um, uh, expanded and enhanced. And um, in general, as I mentioned before, because I'm someone who benefited so much from education, I like those who, especially who've not had uh, all the opportunities uh, in education to be able to take advantage of uh, something like the Fulbright. On my previous answer, I forgot to mention uh, that you know my wife, who's Japanese, uh, really did benefit herself from having uh, uh, gotten her education degree and mas a master's degree in education at Harvard, and also getting an MBA from Stanford. And I think you know she's been on some like thirteen corporate boards in Japan, uh, and uh, she probably would not have had these opportunities. Um, as a uh, pioneering, pioneering Japanese woman on corporate boards uh, if she had not studied in the United States. Well, and I think too, with one minute left here, I, I just appreciate all the interest that we've had tonight. And I would hope that people will continue to follow up even with, with me or with you because uh, we're pretty available to you know, talk about this and the importance of educational exchange. Also, it was mentioned by the ambassador and that the national interest and national priorities, the US-Japan relationship is so critical that we're months away from the G7. And I think linking it to the national interests of the US and Japan is so critical now. Do you have any final remarks uh, just to kind of get us excited about going forward with international exchange? Well, I, I think I'm going to recap what I said by saying that education is so critical on the individual level, on the societal level, on the global level. And uh, I, I really hope that uh, young Japanese will go abroad, take advantage of opportunities presented by Fulbright and others to, uh, to really um, you know, challenge themselves to to have new experiences, to uh, be stimulated, to have new ways of, of thinking, new approaches to problem solving, and also to be able to collaborate in solving these problems. I think a lot of these problems are not problems that you know individuals on their own can solve. They, it requires collaboration and cooperation in groups, both within countries and across countries. And I think study abroad will provide the kind of tools and mindset for individuals to be able to cooperate more effectively across cultures and uh, 
languages and countries and professions and ideologies, et cetera. Glenn, thank you so much. And uh, I, I'm gonna hold you to that book because okay. <laughs> I studied intercultural communication in graduate school. And that was <laughs> an excellent summary of why Fulbright, why do a Fulbright. So I'm gonna hand it over now to Grace. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much to Glenn. Thank you so much to Nancy. And thank you so much for all of you for joining us this evening for our special webinar with a Fulbright alum, Glenn S. Fukushima. Um, as you can see on the slide, we also wanted to share information about the current grant opportunity that is available uh, through Fulbright. Uh, so for those of you who are eligible and interested, um, please do check out more information um, about uh, the Fulbright program. Um, please take a look at the Fulbright Japan website. Uh, you can see the QR code as well that will give you more information about what the requirements are and what opportunities lay ahead for you um, so that one day in the future, you too may be the may be the one that is doing a conversation with a Fulbright alum. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, we do ask that you uh, take our post uh, webinar survey, if you can see the QR code here. Um, so do please do uh, let us know um, what you thought of this webinar. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Thanks everyone and have a great evening.